and welcome to a special review episode here on the Outlaw Nation. I almost feel like sh like I should have had a psychedelic version of the opening <laughs> theme song to my uh, usual stuff here on the Outlaw Nation to coincide with what we're talking about today. I am the Outlaw John Roca. Very excited to welcome my cinephiles co-host, but my brother in Beatles love, the great Steve Morris. How are you, Steve? I'm good. And it's just, I can't believe that it's 2023. I'm a 55 year old man and I'm <laughs> listening to woke up this morning to listen to a new track from the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah. That is something. It's crazy. And that's what we're talking about today. The Beatles now and then the new song that dropped uh, yesterday, a nice reference there, but also the 12 minute mini documentary directed and written by Oliver Murray that accompanied the release uh, of this song. We're just going to discuss the documentary and we're going to discuss our reactions to the song overall, but I just want to give you guys a little bit of background on how this all came to be. This is uh, based off a demo that John Lennon recorded in 1977. Um, this is a part of the tape that uh, Yoko Ono gave Paul McCartney in like 1994, right around that time, with four songs that were on that tape that they used. We have uh, Real Love and we had um, Free as a Bird, which actually came out as songs and then it was grow old with me i think was the other one and then this one now that we have now and then and at the time they tried to work on it during the anthology for those of you who remember watching that on abc all those years ago they tried to work on it as a third single to release with the three separate versions of the or three separate um editions of the anthology that they had that they came that came out but they couldn't make it work uh george thought the song was a little bit called quote unquote fucking rubbish but then eventually <laughs> eventually because george no matter how much of a buddhist he was he certainly wasn't shy with opinions but eventually in 20 uh 2021 2022 something like that when they were working on the get back uh documentary peter jackson discovered this technology or was able to create this technology this mal system that was able to pull a john lennon's voice off of uh, uh the to its own thing and the piano to its own thing, because that was the problem with the demo. They couldn't separate back in the 90s the piano from the voice. And now that they were able to do that, they were able to uh, uh, reconstruct this song and add some new things with contributions from George Harrison when it, they tried to work on the song back in the 90s, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. So, um, Steve, you, you talked about this just a few minutes ago, this idea of waking up with a new Beatles song. We're being pitched that this is the final Beatles song, the period on the end of the story. What are your thoughts when you think about the Beatles now and hearing and, and just, I don't know, thinking, uh, accepting the idea that we were able to get one more song here all these years later after they broke up? I think that the... It's really hard to explain my feelings on this because <laughs> on the one hand, it's like any chance to have a new Beatles thing I'm excited about. Right. This is, there's this incredible chemistry that happens when these four people get together and yeah. they are able to be greater than the sum of the parts. And I, you know, it's not that John Lennon didn't make great music. It's not that, you know, George and Paul did and even yeah, Ringo even had some, some decent songs after, but together they're the Beatles. Yeah. And so I and so going like, oh, I'm going to get one more Beatles thing is is great. And then listening to the song, I've listened to the song multiple times now, yes. many times. Yes. And I listen to it in different environments. Like I listen to it in my car. I listen Ooh. to it on some headphones. I listen I to it on my surround sound system because I wanted to hear how the the parts sort of separated out. And it, yeah. it, I will say it does feel to some degree like a Beatles song, whatever that means, yeah. because the range of Beatles songs is like, well, I want to hold your hand and I'm the walrus and, you know, <laughs> little piggies and bungalow bill. And she's so heavy and come together and like octopus's yeah. garden. There's a wide range of what a Beatles song is. And I, but I could hear some of those elements. I might be kind of with George a little bit on mm. is the original material like yeah. the the strongest thing. And I really wonder if you went, because who knows how John felt about this right. particular demo? Sure, you know, sure. like, did he go like, this is the greatest song that I have ever written and I wish it could be a Beatles song? Or did he go, oh, that's okay. That's interesting. We'll maybe right. play around with that more later. We don't really know, you know? Yeah. What's your what's your reaction to it? Well, just utter love, man. Uh, honestly, like I liked uh, Free as a Bird. I liked Real Love. Yes, were they at the quality of like, as you mentioned, Eleanor Rigby or Hey Jude or Across the Universe? Maybe not, but it was nice to get something. And the three of them coming together to work on these two songs and really working on Now and Then as well. They just couldn't get it quite right because of the tech 
the limits of technology back then. Yeah. But overall, to me, I just love the Beatles and I love the possibility of a new song from the Beatles. That being said, I know Real Love and Free as a Bird were not received that well. Didn't do that great on the charts. You know, right. a lot of people ought to be number one for a while or what have you. Because I think also the limits in technology back then also made this feel like they were trying to make this happen. This song, with the new technology, and dare I say it, because they said it themselves, with the artificial intelligence involved here, this feels much more like a Beatles song than Free as a Bird or Real Love did. And I almost want them, Steve, to go back and remix uh, Real Love and remix Free as a Bird and clean it up so that it doesn't, so it sounds much more natural like John Lennon's voice sounds on this song. Plus, and I'll say this, and some people might get mad at me, I didn't like the overt Jeff Lynn influence in those songs, Free as a Bird and uh, mm. Real Love overall. I like Jeff Lynn. I just didn't like the influence and the style and the sound. It made it feel a little more like ELO and a little less like the Beatles or like Traveling Wilburys and a little less like the Beatles. So this, though, the way it was remixed, the strings being put in by Giles Martin, George Martin's son, all of this and then the new lyrics it just added on the on the fringes and the the um the new uh, Paul McCartney stuff that they added with the bass the George Harrison stuff that they emulated the Ringo Starr this feels much more like a Beatles song and if this is the last thing we ever get cuz you never know Steve someone could find sure. something somewhere i think this is a great ending to the Beatles story overall and, and there's a sadness to it so yes as yeah. much as joy and love that i have I also have a bittersweet sadness knowing that this might be the last song we ever get with these four in a way combining together to create a song. Well, frankly, it's a bittersweet song. I mean, yeah, it, it like yeah. like the feeling of it is is and and I listened to a little bit of the original demo track of just, yes. just John's voice is that there is a it is not I, I, I'm not a musician, as you know, um, yeah. but I do know like that one of the ways that music works is it has patterns where you sort of can feel where the song wants to go. I want to go here. And this song doesn't give you that. Like yeah. just with the, you know, you know, the just that first lyric. I know it's true. It's, a it's just as yeah. a little odd and a little off and a little dissonant in a very John Lennon way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because the, yeah. the thing about it is like the, the, you know, the basic idea is, you know, I couldn't do this without you, you right. know, but it right. isn't super romantic and just like you're amazing. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, I couldn't do this without you, but there's, a, it feels musically to me. And I don't know what your reaction is yeah. that there's a, butt in there, that there's pain in there, that there's this other thing in there. And I don't know what it evoked for you, but I, because of the story around how this happened, yeah. I couldn't take all for you as like, it's about Yoko Ono or it's about right. Sean or, you know, Julian or something like that. It felt like it was about Paul McCartney. You know what I mean? Yeah, it felt yeah. like I couldn't have done this without, without having you in my life, without having yeah. the Beatles in my life. I couldn't be who I am, but also having you in my life is connected to pain. That's yeah. how, that's how I felt listening to the song. I don't know that that's John Lennon's intention or what right. Paul McCartney and Ringo were thinking as they were putting this together, but emotionally, that's what I was getting out of it. Yeah, and, and I think that's actually an excellent point to make, Steve, for me listening to you say that, because yeah, I, I, I think what's great about the lyrics of this song is that they can be applied, because remember, this is 1977. This is right after a John Lennon's self-described insane phase uh, where you know another woman came in while Yoko was off doing her thing, and there's all this kind of interesting way they reconstructed their relationship or had their relationship. So he could absolutely be singing this to Yoko. You know, if I make mm -hmm. it through, it's all because of you. Someone described it as as an apologetic love song, and certainly you see that. But remember, when Double Fantasy comes out three years later, there's a lot of vulnerability in John. There's yeah. a lot of looking back. There's a lot of reflecting. There's a lot of loving what was before. And we know that around 1974, they kind of got back together, John and, and Paul, and conversations and friendships. And so clearly, you know, some time away from a toxic situation, a, a great situation that had grown toxic, then you start to find a, embrace the um, good feelings, embrace the great stuff that happened uh, and get reflected. And so I would not be surprised that there was, that he was thinking of Yoko. He was thinking of George and Paul and Ringo, thinking of his mom, maybe thinking of all these things that influenced him emotionally as he was becoming, you know, going into his forties. And so 
this thing that you that you see as people get older is the reflective nature of it, especially with artists, great artists. And I think there's an element of that throughout this. So the fact that it's ambiguous, I think, helps us to think of whatever we want to think about. And it makes it easier for us to apply this song to our own lives and what we might feel. And, you know, Steve, you and I are older now, reflecting back on the people that were important, the people we lost, the friendships that were broken, the relationships that didn't work out, and the relationships that did work out. All those things are can course through. And I think that's what makes this song because it has, it can apply to more things, I guess, is what I would say. Well, when you have lyrics as simple as these lyrics are, and that's yeah. not, it's not a criticism saying right, they're simple, right. then it allows us to put whatever we want onto it. Um, one thing yeah. I'm curious about, and I watched yeah. the documentary as well. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. For for me, by the way, 12 minutes was not enough. Oh my God. I, you know, particularly thinking about, I spent eight hours or whatever it was and get back. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to see the process of how they put the song together, how they Ooh. made the decisions. And I'm a, I got to assume that Paul McCartney is the leader on this. Oh and yes. It's like, you know, coming up with the, the, the melody line for the strings or coming up with how you're going to do the mix or, or what, you know, like all of those sort of decisions I wanted more, but the big thing yeah that I feel like they glossed over and maybe intentionally glossed over. Yeah. How much actual George Harrison guitar is actually in this? That's yeah. what I, cause I know he says, well, I, I thought of doing this slide guitar mm -hmm. in George's style. So I think most of the guitar solo isn't George Harrison. It has a George Harrison ish quality yes. to it. Yes. But, but that's one of the big things is like, well, is there a lot of George in this or not much at all? Well, know? I think, you know, what they say in the documentary, I think is the way uh, that I look at it is that it, it was Paul's homage to George. And yeah. um, apparently there's outtakes where he is calling kind, kind of calling out George for his contribution to now and then back in the nineties when they were trying to work on this over mm. a day or day and a half. And he was kind of giving George a little bit of shit saying to him, this sounds like um, uh, my sweet lord. This sounds like your stuff from my sweet lord. Can't you do something differently? Or can so uh, still Paul being the kind of older brother, bigger brother type thing, giving George yeah. a little bit of shit. So maybe by Paul redoing George's contribution, it was his way of saying I'm sorry as well and doing it your way. And I was watching a BBC One, um, like a 15 minute video they have on YouTube they're all reacting to the song or to the documentary right. in real time and to the song. And Giles Martin was on there as a guest who was of oh. course the gentleman who is the son of George Martin and produced the string part of uh, this song. And he said, Paul was very clear about honoring George's contribution. And he said that, you know, he did redo mm. some of it, but he wanted to redo it and make sure it sounded exactly as George would have intended it to sound. And so in a way we may not get the full George Harrison, but having Paul essentially playing what George Harrison laid out in a way is kind of bringing George into the mix. Um, and I like that because it seems like Paul didn't veer out of his way to make it his own. He very much tried to adhere to what George was doing as his contribution. So I can I definitely take your point that it, well, it may not be the full George, but there's enough here that I think you can argue that he did contribute to it overall. What well, you yeah, but, sorry, I was just going to say there's there is what's crazy about this. There's no other band that is treated as so sacrosanct that a single player. I mean, every other band oh, we know of, there are players that came and went, and this drummer yeah. died, and you brought somebody else in, and they're still who they are. Whereas right. the Beatles, without one of them, they're not the Beatles. Yeah, you know, you're 100 right. This isn't Spinal Tap. You can't keep replacing the the the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the drummer. drummer. Yeah, the drummer. For those of you who are who don't know, Steve and I host a show called The Cinephiles, where we break down. Uh, one movie every week, sometimes over multiple parts, a uh, classic movie. And one of our most recent episodes was This is Spinal Tap. So if you want to hear what Steve and I have to say about it, you can go to wherever you download podcasts and subscribe to The Cinephiles and uh, look up that uh, episode. And I guarantee you'll enjoy it. That was one of our uh, best episodes uh, recently here. Um, but Steve, what were your thoughts on the conversations that were had in this documentary? It's a 12-minute documentary, as I said, written and directed by Oliver Murray. And we got to hear not only from Ringo and Paul, but we also got to hear from Sean Lennon and what he corrected here, this perception that John walked away from music to take care of Sean. And he says a little bit of that is true, but not a hundred percent. He did still create music. He was still inspired to make music while I was there and what have you. So was that a, a little surprising for you to hear? Well, so first of all, I, I loved hearing Sean Lennon. I don't think we would have felt as good about the song if we didn't have Sean's sort of seal of approval on it. Yeah. And I also think, and and it, these are things I sort of suspected, but then 
get back the doc, the Peter Jackson documentary really confirmed that our whole image of who these people were and yeah. are has been just totally blown up in all of these crazy ways. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like, yeah, they did have fights. Yeah, they did have arguments and disagreements and, and upsets and all that stuff, but they were a great band. Yeah. And the thing about, and you know, you've got musicians in your life. I have musicians sure. in my life. Sure. Musicians don't stop playing music, you know? Yeah, so yeah. like the idea like that John Lennon just see who, who couldn't go anywhere without a guitar or always, you know, like was obsessed with music his entire life yeah. would then just give it up. That doesn't make sense at all. Like, yeah. you know, maybe he's retrenching and tr trying to be a better family man and all of those things. That's totally true, but he's not given up music like that. Right. That right. So, you know, and it's also, it's funny the, the the big thing that I think, and it relates to the song as well. And it really yeah. came out of watching get back is that th the, the back and forth with the four of them is what mm. makes the band so much better, you yeah. know, is yeah. that, yeah, George Harrison doesn't like a certain thing or thinks it's treacle. And yes, Paul McCartney is trying to control things and have his own way. And yes, John Lennon is always kind of throwing in jokes or throwing in things to disrupt things. And yes, Ringo does seem to be really nice and ready to help everybody. <laughs> but, but like, but like, and so, so I go, I, it, it also hearing Sean's voice, I, I went, ah, oh, I wonder what John would have said. I wonder yeah. what George would have said because they would have pushed back on Paul. You know what I mean? Of course. And, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and so there was more, there's a moment in the song. It's, it's, it's where it is became the most Beatle like for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's right at the end when the strings come in Yes, and it, and, right. and it changes the whole tone of the song yeah. and it started to go to a different place, but then it didn't keep going there. Like I want, like there was part of me that wanted it to be a day in the life where we suddenly went off on a musical journey <laughs> like that isn't yeah, yeah yeah that isn't a that isn't the john lennon song but it's like now this is we've gone from john to paul and now we've grown into this other thing and it didn't really embrace that fully but i could feel the the genius there and, the, and then you also go i mean how old's paul paul's they're in their 80s now right Yeah, 83 i think yeah i think actually i think paul's almost exactly my mom's age and my mom's 82 oh, so okay. so a by the way it occurred to me as i was watching this that Paul McCartney has now lived more of his life without John Lennon than he lived with John Lennon, Ooh, good point. which is a really weird thing to think about. And I also go like, you know, 80 year old guys still pulling out the, you know, the, the, the instruments and Ringo's drumming sounded great for an 80 year old guy, you know, like, I think like it's impressive, but it's also, these aren't the guys of 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, and yeah. so we can't expect them to do what they did before, you know? Yeah. And, and just to uh, clear that he's 81. So it wasn't 83, he's 81. But like you said, Steve, and I think that makes total sense. Um, his 81, as Shaq once said, 39 ain't 29, bro. 81 yeah. ain't 41, bro. So your voice is going to sound different. Even, you know, this is almost two decades after the anthology yeah what they did free as a bird and uh, uh real love and paul i think smartly understood i can't give myself a verse here i can't no. sing along at the same level this is a young in his prime john lennon voice i can't match that so he's coming in at the end as at the, at the last part of verses under the last line um to fit what he can sing and I think that was fine. And that's the smart move, right? Play as subtly as possible. We can still hear you, but play as subtly as possible and add Ringo's drums, which were great. I love seeing that in the documentary as well, what he was contributing. I agree with you, Steve. I mean, we're spoiled by what, eight to nine hours on Get Back. Yeah. Uh, and so getting a chance to like have an entire hour and a half or two hour documentary where we're in the studio and they're hashing out how all of this works. I think would have been fun, but hearing them, I think they were playing their outtakes of them working on now and then mm -hmm. during the end credits of the documentary back in the nineties. And so that was a nice little element to throw in there. I think one, one of the things from the documentary stood out to me, Stephen, I'll get your thoughts on this, you know, to kind of address what people might say, which is all oh, you're taking advantage of a guy who's dead. How do you know John would be okay with this? Everybody seemed to chime in from Sean to, to uh, Paul, to George, uh, to Giles, oh, not sorry, George, I'm sorry, Ringo, Giles, saying that John loved to play with the technology, loved to push the limits oh, yeah. of technology. Uh, and Peter Jackson said this as well. So they all believe, and I think rightly so, that John would be excited by something like this with because we look at the last 
few years of their albums, it was a lot of experimentation uh, and pushing the limits and pushing the boundaries of what they could create. So do you agree with that assessment that you think John would have been um, would have enjoyed this technology, well, would have been OK with it being used to create the song? Well, I've been nodding the whole time you've been talking. So to probably, spoiler alert, of course, I agree. Um, several things about it. First, just on the technology. I just have to say when I was when I was in film school and I took sound classes, we were taught very clearly that you had to be really, really good about how you recorded sound because once yeah. something was on the tape, you could never get it off. Yeah. If you didn't have the levels right. That was forever. If you had background sound, you, you could take it off to some degree. But we were taught, you know, it's like if it's in the same frequency of the human voice, it'll be there forever. There's no way to get rid of it. Right. This technology is totally insane. Right. Like the di difference between what you sounded like that on that little cassette tape and the reedy thin sounding voice and the piano coming in and out. And then when they play the isolated John Lennon voice and it's rich and full, I got to ask you that, totally Steve, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I got to tell me what that experience was like for you as an editor. And you, we've been talking audio stuff recently. You've gotten yeah. more aware of audio stuff. What was that like for you to hear John Lennon's voice removed from the piano and just on its own, like they do with the documentary? Fucking magic. That's what it feels like to me because I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like I lit, I had three semesters of sound classes when I was in film school and over, this was the word. Once that is in, you cannot get it out. And I've even like learned when, when Pro Tools came along and there's more modern computer technology and you could have these spectral graphs of frequencies and you could highlight certain frequencies and remove them, which was really cool. Yeah. And it was painstaking and brutal. And now even at our level, because we played with, as you said, we've been playing with a little bit. We've yeah. put in some bad audio into some software, and it spit out way better audio. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, I mean, that's that's so just alone. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Um. Also, what you said about technology, obviously, it's totally true. As they started to be able to pitch shift and layer multiple recordings and all this, John, more than any of them, is my understanding, was right. fascinated with all of that. So I don't think he'd have any problem with that. And the other thing of like people, people who say that an artist would be upset at somebody completing the work that they didn't finish it has never been a fucking artist that has tons of work that hasn't been completed. If I die tomorrow, which let's yes. hope that I don't, let's and hope you, you, don't. Deci you decide to raise millions of dollars to produce one of my screenplays, I'm going to be real if I'm dead. So, I, But <laughs> if, other than that, I'm happy about that. That's what we want. Like the, I, I, you know, and yes, of course, John might've said, wait, that song or right. I wouldn't it's do totally it like possible. that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that someone wants to continue your work after you're gone, that's part of why we're doing this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, that's well, the, that's the point. I agree. And there's a clip in the, in the documentary of George Harrison back during that anthology recording saying like, you know, you should see what Jeff Lynn is doing with his computer. So certainly even George, who is notoriously the most, uh, stringent about certain yeah. things and sounds and as, as i said earlier certainly saying that this song wasn't that great uh or fucking rubbish as, as paul said <laughs> quoted him as saying uh um would have would not have been talking about the computer if he didn't like the idea of a computer being able to adjust and and uh, clear up and clean up some of this stuff so clearly they all for all their um instincts musically they did respect the advances in technology and what they could do with that kind of technology and even push the limits themselves in creating new ways to make sounds uh in technology which of course influenced uh, the beach boys with pet sounds so oh, yeah. there's a lot here and certainly many bands still influenced by the beatles and some of the technology that they used in creating uh their music um is there anything more we should touch on with this with the documentary or with the song that you want to make sure we we kind of hit on Steve and make sure we, people know we're, we, we want to talk about it? I think the biggest thing for me is mm -hmm. that part of the reason, I, yes, there are some songs where you hear it the first time and you go, that's mm -hmm. a great song. But there's also, and this is particularly true of the Beatles, is that the Beatles were, I had heard those songs over and over again yeah. long before I ever started to listen to them with intent. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the Beatles were ubiquitous. They, you know, they played everywhere. And then, so, so by the time that I became a, you know, a teenager or an adult and a more mature listener of music, yeah. I'd already heard those songs hundreds of times. Right. And then I discovered how great they were. This, I, while I listened very carefully to the song a few times before coming on to talk with you, hmm. I haven't had years of it playing. Right. So I don't know what my feeling will be in terms of this within you know, the, the, the 
the realm of Beatles songs. Like, will I go like, yeah, this is totally fits right in there. And I would listen to it all the time, like all the other Beatles songs, or will it be more like the, you know, as you mentioned, the ones released at the anthology mm -hmm. where I like them, I like but them. they don't, you know, they don't, they're not Hey Jude. They're not oh, yesterday. Right. They're, you know, they're not those kinds of things. So exactly. like, that's the thing that I don't know today that will take a long time before I actually know the answer to. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's a rarity about this group. It really went out. They really went out on top. Like their last few albums, you could argue, are some of the greatest albums ever made. It wasn't like they were running out of gas. Oh, so no. like Real Love and Free as a Bird could fit amongst those songs, even though they are including Now and Then, which I think is the best song of the three. Uh, they're, in, they're including it in the new reissue of uh, their anthology of 1967 mm. to 1970s. Uh, and speaking of feelings about the song here, I'm just read a couple quick co uh, quotes from reviews. The LA Times described the song as elegant and softly psychedelic. A wistful undercurrent flows through it and a fitting conclusion of the Beatles' rec recorded career. The Guardian gave the song four stars out of five, saying it is a, quote, poignant act of closure. Rolling Stone get, called it, quote, the final masterpiece that the Beatles and their fans deserve. The Washington Post, not as uh, glowing, just to be fair here, uh, said, it, quote, it was not terrible. And kind of mundane. <laughs> <laughs> so the balance is there and however you take it. But I think this one has a real contention to become one of the favorites for Beatles fans. Because, as you said, the simplicity of the lyrics, but I think also the way they created the song and constructed the song, it feels very much like a Beatles song. And I think, as you just said as well, Steve, the more as time goes on, the more people listen to it. I think it may grow in people's estimation as it goes along. And I, this is already one of my favorites just to i like you i've listened to it at least five or six times uh before i came on to talk about it here so um i was can, worried can i add can i add one more review yes. so I, as i said i played it in the car what i didn't say is i played it in the car this morning as i was driving my son to school ah, and while nice. we have been sitting here doing this review on this song i got a text from my son saying can you send me a link to that Beatles song <laughs> No better recommendation for a song than the new generation liking yep. the last song they ever did. That's actually a great, great uh, um, compliment for that song for sure, Steve. So definitely. Um, well, there you go. That's our review. We wanted to talk about the song. We wanted to talk about the 12 minute documentary. For those of you who don't know, Steve Morris and I and Scott Mance did a review of Get Back, which is right here on the Outlaw Nation channel. Just type in the search engine, Get Back in our three names, and it'll pop up. And you can hear our review of those multiple hours of that document. It was one of my favorite conversations to have with Steve and Scott. We've had many great conversations, but that one about the Beatles was a lot of fun. And Steve, I made, I'm letting you know this, I may just rope you into another Beatles conversation because the music video, as we're recording this, comes out on the 3rd, which is tomorrow. It is directed by Peter Jackson, and apparently it will feature never-before-seen film of the Beatles, including footage by Pete Best and scenes filmed during the 1995 recording sessions for Anthology, which looked beautiful in that 12-minute documentary. I hope they re-release that in 4K. I would buy that Anthology in a heartbeat in 4k um all right steve where can people find you and everything you got going on brother man well you can uh find me at sr morris on twitter sr morris one on instagram john you already mentioned the cinephiles and i got one more place to direct people Please. which is also with scott mance you could go to the cinephiles podcast and find our review of the beatles a hard day's night which is an absolutely fantastic conversation yeah. about them and their first and what i think most of us agree is their best film um and uh and so that's the cinephiles. And I think that's everything I have to share at this point. I have nothing else to share. <laughs> there you go. As for me, uh, you can follow me at the Roku says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. As Steve said, the cinephiles, trust me, it's a great podcast. Y'all should listen to it. We get hundreds of thousands of downloads a month. So it's a damn good show. Go and take a chance on it. As for my channel, you can subscribe down below and hit that bell button. So you see, we're dropping all the content we do and surprising content like this that we do here on the channel. Be alerted by it when you click that bell below as well leave us your comments down below put a like on this video share it on your social media let us know what you thought about the song let us know what you thought about the lyrics what you thought about the documentary as well we'd love to hear from you uh, especially you beatles fans we love you madly and we'll talk to you next time here on the outlaw nation with another review uh with me or with steve morris we'll see you down the road take care until then Ooh.